Hello guys, my name is Edward Seleduk and today I welcome you to a new session from the teaching series Save for Eternity in which we'll continue to discuss about objections against eternal salvation. And our first obje objection for today comes from Galatians chapter 5 verses 19 to 21 and it's entitled The Practice of Fleshly Works. Let's read this passage from the New King James Version. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, rivalries, and the like. Of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Some preachers use this passage to threaten Christians that if they habitually practice the works of the flesh described in the text, they can lose their salvation at any time without knowing. Uh, but first, as we demonstrated in the previous section or session, inheriting the kingdom is the same thing to being saved. Second, Paul doesn't say that those people who practice fleshly works will be disinherited from a state of heirs, but that they will not inherit anything in the first place. Third, he doesn't specify a clear timeline or a number of times after which those who practice the works of the flesh will lose their salvation. Fourth, if we look carefully in the, uh, the context, a few verses before and a few verses after our passage, we can quickly discover that the Apostle Paul is portraying a stark contrast between the flesh and the spirit and between the works of the flesh and the fruits of the spirit. He says, I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. So I read this passage from Galatians 5, verses 16 to 17. He merely puts them side by side for comparison and godly instruction to believers. After enumerating all the works of the flesh, he begins verse 22 with the preposition, but which commences the enumeration of the fruits of the Spirit. He concludes in verse 24 that those who are Christ's, who are different from those who practice the works of the flesh and, will, and those will, who will not inherit the kingdom, so he concludes that those who are in Christ have already crucified their flesh with its passions and desires. So he encourages believers to live according to the truth about their already changed nature. In fact, in verse 25, he says this, If you are in the Spirit, and you live in Him and belong to God, then also walk and behave in the Spirit or according to Him. The theme is clearly the renewal of the minds of, of believers in Christ and not their loss of salvation. Let's move forward to a, a second objection uh, coming from Ephesians chapter 5, verses 5 to 6, where it talks about the sons of disobedience. And this is part one about the sons of disobedience. There are other texts uh, about, the past, the, about the sons of disobedience, and we'll cover it in this session. Let's read Ephesians 5, verses 5 to 6. I'm, I'm reading from New King James Version. For this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, no covetous man who is an idolat idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. This text, which is often used again as an objection to eternal salvation, is very similar to two other scriptures from previous sessions with a new addition. The wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. This is the addition. The implication is that believers in Christ who are sons of God and disobey Him 
by doing any of the shameful, shameful things that I just enumerated, those will come under the wrath of God after a certain point. However, what kind of disobedience is Paul talking about here? It's disobedience of faith, not disobedience to the law. He also says in Romans 1 verse 5 that through Jesus we receive the grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all nations. Sons of, disobedience, uh, no, sons of obedience are those who put their faith in Christ while the sons of disobedience are those without Christ. And again here, the main argument to this objection is that the, uh, the Apostle Paul describes the behavior of those who will never inherit the kingdom of God and are, are under his wrath with the purpose of teaching believers how not to live. He begins in Ephesians 4 verse 17 by saying, you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk. And he continues with this contrast throughout chapters 4 and 5. And we see that in Ephesians 5 verse 1, Paul encourages believers in the church of Ephesus to become imitators of God as beloved children. And in verse 7 of the same chapter, he instructs them not to be partakers of, with the sons of disobedience. Then in verse 8, Paul clarifies even more that they were once darkness, but now they are light in the Lord. So they should walk according to that light from inside of them. So they are, uh, they are not those who will be disinherited if they persist long enough in sinful behaviors. The phrase wrath of God is meant to emphasize the gravity of sin. Although Jesus Christ has removed all sin and condemnation at the time of salvation, that doesn't mean God became softer on sin or, uh, or that we can be relaxed about it. We should strive to differentiate ourselves from darkness and live according to the kingdom standards we inherited. Amen. Uh, let's move on to another objection from Colossians chapter 3, verses 5 to 11. Uh, it's about the sons of disobedience, part 2. Let's read this passage again from New King James Version. Colossians 3, 5-11 Therefore put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. But now you yourselves are, put, are to put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all and in all. This passage is identical to Ephesians 5, verses 5 to 6, uh, which we covered uh, just a little bit earlier, which we already explained. Uh, still, I wanted to include it separately here for repetition and to cover all possible objections people might bring to the eternal salvation of the new creation. And based on the context of the passage, we can quickly notice again the contrast Paul clearly makes between the unsaved, the sons of disobedience, and the saved, who might still do sinful things. That is precisely the reason for such a comparison, because Christians usually still do sinful things in the process of mind renewal and sanctification, right? Verse 5 begins with the preposition, Therefore, which introduces the result of what has already happened. Because you died with Christ, Colossians 3.3, 3, and were raised with Christ, Colossians 3.1, therefore put to death the earthly things like fornication, uncleanness, evil desires, etc. Verse 7 continues in the past tense, saying this, in which you yourselves 
once walked when you lived in them. And finally, verse 8 says, But now, but now, put aside all these things, anger, wrath, malice, uh, and all these things. So Paul doesn't say here the Christians in the church of Colossae might become sons of disobedience through their sinful deeds and come under wrath, but that they should change their way of life now that they have inherited the kingdom of God and are no, are no longer under his wrath. Amen? Uh, one more objection from Revelation. It's a verse. Je Revelation 21 verse 8. Uh, it's, it, it talks about the punishment of the second death. Let's read this verse. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually Im immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So, again, some Christians in the body of Christ use this verse to advocate that believers who don't live a holy enough life according to decent moral standards might end up in the lake of fire that is the second death. Um, and if you want to believe this interpretation, no one can stop you. Uh, however, if we are really interested in knowing the intention and the truth of the verse in the context of the whole scripture, we can see it clearly. I mean, it's not simple, but it's clear. <laughs> First, notice the, the Apostle John doesn't say that those in Christ who behave cowardly, unbelievingly, abominably, or murderously will suffer the second death. Instead, he names them according to their nature and identity, which is not in Christ. Moreover, he begins verse 8 with the preposition but, clearly demarcating those who conquer and who will inherit the things of God in verse 7 from the liars and the sexually immoral people who will go to the lake of fire. And furthermore, as I previously mentioned, the Bible never identifies the righteous people of God with those sinful designations described in Revelation 21 verse 8. Even in the Old Testament, when Christ had not come yet, when the angel went to Gideon or to, to Daniel, he all, always called them mighty men of God, or I don't know, he called them by how God saw them, not by how they looked or what they did. Amen? Uh, one more objection from Matthew 24, verses 3 to 14. Many will fall away. Let's read this uh, a little bit long passage. Matthew 24, verses 3 to 14. I'm going to read from New America Standard Bible 95. As he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things happen, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to them, See to it that no one misleads you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will mislead many. You will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not frightened, for those things must take place, but that is not yet the end. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And in various places there will be famines and earthquakes. But all these things are merely the beginning of birth pangs. Then they will deliver you to tribulation and will kill you and you will be hated by all nations because of my name. At that time, many will fall away and will betray one another and hate one another. Many false prophets will arise and will mislead many, because lawlessness is increased. Most people's love will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end, he will be saved. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. Amen. Here, Jesus talks about a difficult period of time for Christians in the future, Characterized by deceit, wars, famines, earthquakes, betrayals, and increased lawlessness. And depending on your perspective on the end times, this challenging season may have already happened in 70 AD, just for Christian Jews, when Titus destroyed the temple, or it may refer, refer to the time close to the second coming of Jesus, the so-called rapture, or it may refer to the period of the Great Tribulation. However, the end times 
are not the subject of this session. The bottom line is that Jesus describes a strenuous time in which Christians will be on earth. Many Christians think this text refers to genuine believers living in those times who will lose their salvation because of the trials. They advocate for this interpretation because of the phrases like many will fall away in verse 10, the love of many will grow cold in verse 12, and he who endures to the end shall be saved in verse 13. They interpret the word saved from verse 13 as referring to eternal salvation and reason that since only those who endure to the end will be saved, then it must be that some will not endure to the end and they will not be saved. However, the context of the whole passage is not eternal salvation. That is not in play here, but rather physical tribulations and persecutions on earth for Jesus' name's sake during those times. The falling away from verse 10, which is rendered more correctly in the New King James Version Bible translation as being offended, refers to backsliding in faith for a while and not necessarily losing eternal salvation. And we know that because the following verses describe in what way many will be offended or fall away. They will betray one another and hate one another, and their love will grow cold because of lawlessness. All these actions show a lack of faith in Jesus and the gospel for this present life and not a lack of faith in the gospel for the future life. Now, why would believers betray other people? It would be out of fear of a threat or to gain some benefit during those difficult times. And what does that show? It shows lack of faith in the provision of the gospel for their physical needs and not lack of faith for the forgiveness of their sins. Why would love grow cold in some believers during those times? Because of lawlessness all around them. Everybody will become more selfish and look out only for themselves. Times will be difficult. God maybe will not seem to intervene on their behalf and they will gradually lose the awareness of God's love for them and care for them so they will begin losing their love for other people as well. That is kind of what is happening today in our world if we look around. That doesn't mean those believers are lost forever. It just means they are temporarily weaker in faith regarding the things of this life. Their love will not disappear completely. It will just grow cold for a while. The Greek word used in verse 10 for falling away or being offended is skandalizo, which means to stumble. And Jesus uses this same Greek word in Matthew 26 verses 31 to 33 when he tells his disciples all of them will fall away because of him on the night of his betrayal. Let's read this passage. Matthew 26, 31 to 33. Then Jesus said to them, You will all fall away because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike down the shepherd and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. But Peter said to him, Even though all may fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Again, the New King James Version Bible translation renders the falling away more correctly as being made to stumble. It reads like this. Then Jesus said to them, All of you will be made to stumble because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter answered and said to him, Even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble. Now, when Jesus told his disciples they would all fall away that night because of him, he was not talking about them losing their salvation, but rather about them stumbling temporarily in their trust in Jesus. They were not even saved yet at that point. They didn't have a salvation to lose because uh, Jesus had not yet died for them and had not yet been resurrected. Moreover, we know that later most of the disciples, except Judas Iscariot, were saved and even martyred for the gospel. Also think about Peter for a moment. Even though he told Jesus he would never fall away and never stumble, 
He fell away when he betrayed him three times, but that was a temporary backsliding. He prayed after that and he was restored to faith. Falling away never means falling away from salvation irrevocably. Now let's go back to Matthew 24 verse 13. It says, The one who endures to the end, he will be saved. As I said earlier, the context of that whole passage is not eternal salvation, but tribulation and persecution for the name of Jesus. When this persecution strikes, Christians have two options. First option, one of them is to keep a low profile by not being so vocal about their faith or, being, or even lying about it. The second option is to stand firm no matter what happens all the way to the end. Now, the word saved here doesn't, mean, uh, doesn't refer to being saved from hell, but being saved from persecution in the sense of being spared and preserved in the middle of it or through it. In Matthew 5, in the Sermon on the, Mount, on the Mountain, Jesus tells people to rejoice when persecution comes. It's noble and right to accept and endure persecution for Jesus and even death for the sake of his name. However, if Christians decide they want to be preserved from persecution, they can be saved from it by faith. Throughout the Old Testament, God always intervened to save his people from persecution when they stood firm in faith and defended his reputation. God defended them back because God likes to win. And I'll say it again. God likes to win. And I'll explain this statement. Think about the three young men in the fiery furnace, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They didn't bow their knee to other gods, even with the price of their lives. But God intervened and preserved them. Not only that, but as a result, God was glorified throughout the kingdom. Think about, then, about Daniel in the lion's den. He chose to serve God and pray to him like he used to, while knowing about the king's decree, decree about who commanded worship only to himself. He even knew evil people were standing by to kill him for his faith. He was ready to die for his God. However, God saved Daniel from the lions, and as a result, he was honored and glorified in all that kingdom. What about Queen Esther and Mordecai? All the Jews in that time were scheduled to be killed for their faith. However, two people stood firm in faith, and as a result, all their people were saved from death, and God was glorified. In the same way, in the end times, those Christians who stand firm in faith, no matter what, will be saved and preserved through persecution. They will prove the word of God in their lives, and God will save their lives. They will be provided for, even through difficult times, and that will be a powerful testimony to other people. As a result, the people will glorify God. Uh, one more objection from Mark 13 to uh, Mark 13 verse 13, endurance to the end. And it says this, And you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. In the Bible, there are more parallel passages related to this one, uh, like Matthew 10, 22, Matthew 24, verse 13, and Luke 21, verses 16 to 19 which will have the same context and meaning. The latter, is especially, the latter is especially relevant because it gives more light in the, on the nature of endurance and salvation. And I, I'm going to read this one. Luke 21, verses 16 to 19 from New American Standard Bible. But you will be betrayed and ev even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death and you will be hated by all because of my name. Yet not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance, you will gain your lives. These passages are often used to argue that only those who continue in faith and good works to the end of their lives will receive salvation or prove that they were genuinely saved in the first place. However, these verses cannot be adequately understood apart from the context. It's clear they speak about the state of things during a difficult period in time 
probably right before Jesus Christ returns. The way the word end is used in any of these parallel passages makes it evident that the end of one's life is not in view here. Beginning with the disciples' uh, questions about the end of the age in Mark 13 verse 4, Matthew 24 verse, verse 3, and Luke 21 verse 7, Jesus gives information about it, mentioning it in Mark 13 verse 7 and Matthew 24 verses 6 and 14. It's clear that Jesus refers to the time before the end of the age. And though some may be killed, those who survive and endure these perils until the end will be delivered or saved from their enemies who are the nations that hate them. This is simply an occasion where the word saved refers to deliverance from danger and not deliverance from hell. Hell is not even mentioned in any of the passages and would be out of place. The text in Luke 21 verse 19 proves this fact in an even more relevant way by specifying clearly the preservation of the physical body during those times in phrases like, not a hair of your head will perish, and another phrase like, by your endurance you will gain your lives, your souls. So the endurance spoken of in Mark 13 verse 13 refers to persisting in faith through that period of severe suffering and persecutions and those who stand firm and live to the end will see a glorious salvation. Amen. I think I'm going to stop here uh, and I'll continue next time until we hear each other next time. I pray that God will bless you as usual and give you joy, peace, and make you enjoy this life. God wants you to enjoy this life, to be full of peace in every situation, to be full of joy, full of the Spirit, overcoming. God has given us a great life. And I pray that you, uh, the eyes of your revelation, will, will, the eyes of your heart will be open to see through revelation uh, that God wants you to enjoy this life. And I pray that you would enjoy it to the full. Like he said, Jesus said, I have come to give you life and life to the full. And he was not using uh, words in vain. He meant what he said. So I pray that you would have a life, you will experience the life of God to the full. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen.